Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and good evening. Um, this is our third installment of our market readiness series, Farmers of Color Network through RAFI USA. My name is Alicia Curry and I'm the Farmers of Color Network Director. Um, I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Elisa Mish and Ray Jeffers. And we are so excited to have events, York and Kamal, to discuss what farmers need to know how to sell farm products to schools and other institutions. Let's see if I can get this slide. Yes. So before we jump into the webinar, I just wanna do some brief housekeeping. First, as I mentioned before, if we can keep everyone on mute until the question and answer time, and then you'll have the ability to ask your questions. Um, we are recording this, so we will be sending this to everyone after the webinar in a couple of days with some other information. Um, and people have already done this, so please introduce yourself in the chat, get to know who's on this webinar, um, where you're located, what you're doing, what you're selling. Yeah. And finally, um, we will have time to answer all your questions. So you can put them in the chat as we're going through the presentation and farmer panel, or just save them for the end and ask them in person. Um, so just a little bit of background of Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. We call ourselves RAFI USA for short. We are a nonprofit, nonprofit organization that challenges the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. So in 2017, the Farmers of, Net, Farmers of Color Network was created to support farmers of color. Um, we provide farmer technical assistance, infrastructure, funding opportunities, networking events, and gatherings like this to expand market access. Um, if you are interested in joining the network, here's a link and all this information can be found on our website. We will also send this to everyone um, after tonight's webinar. So briefly, market readiness series. So one of the activities one, you know, one of the programs of the Farmers of Color Network is to support farmers of color um, with this five-part readiness series. So tonight is about farm to school institutional buying, but we've already had wholesale readiness, gap in organic certification, and that information can be found on our website. And then in the future, we are going to have webinars focusing on how to become a SNAP EBT retailer and working within a collective or collaboration. And so those will come August and October, and we invite you there. Next, I will turn it over to Elisa Mish, our Director of Farmer Outreach and Technical Assistance. Great. Um, we are all here to learn about uh, you know, how to sell to school marketplaces, but I did want to highlight another program within RAFI that's housed within our Farmers of Color Network, and that is the Resources for Resilient Farms project. Um, it is kind of a, it encompasses a couple of different programs, but really it offers uh, some educational um, tools and resources along with direct technical assistance focusing on farmers of color within the Southeast around farm service agency, um, disaster assistance programs. Um, recently we've added loan programs to that list as well as NRCS programs. Um, so really we have a number of ways for farmers to reach out to us to get questions answers, whether you're kind of new to, to farming and just need to get situated within all these different FSA and RCS programs where to start, or if you have specific questions or running into specific issues um, while trying to access um, resources through your FSA office or NRCS, NRCS office, we're here to help. Um, I'll add a couple of things in the chat um, that, that you can also use to get in touch with us. We have a Calendly um, uh, website where you can sign up for a uh, call time and just talk with us about you know what you're looking for in terms of support. Um, and oh, there was one other thing I was going to mention. I can't remember what it is, but yeah, basically we're here to help with um, trying to navigate FSA programs and NRCS. I remembered what it is. We had a, a webinar a few um, weeks ago around how to work with FSA um, and in general, some different um, FSA programs um, that are 
you know, available for farmers, especially farmers starting out. So I'll share a link to that in the chat as well. Um, it included two uh, farmer presenters and they shared their best practices for how they've built um, good working relationships with their NSA office. So it was a, a really great webinar. Um, okay, I think I will turn it over to our first presenter at this point. So our first presenter presenting from the school and institutional um, buyer perspective of farm to school. Um, Vince is a director of nutrition services and warehousing at the Thomas Unified School District, where he oversees the production and service of 10,000 meals a day during the school year. He's a former academic department chair at the Fort Amlu, Los Angeles, where he developed culinary academic curriculum and he serves as an instructor, proctor, and item writer for the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation and a member of the Sacramento Summer Meals Collaborative. He lives in Elk Grove with his wife and two sons. And I think at this point, I will make you the host so you can share your slides. Let's see. Yeah. There you are. Okay. Make host. Oh, you said you're, you're able to share without making house. Yeah, I'm able to. Let me see this real quick. Hi, hi everyone. There you are. Okay. All right. So I am, oops, sorry. As, as Lisa mentioned, I am Vince Coggan um, from Sacramento, California. So Sacramento, we're in this, uh, when I started out here in the Tomas in 2012, we have uh, two weird intersections, um, which kind of set us up to do well. well so I'll kind of tell you our backstory. Um, one, our mayor at that time, Kevin Johnson. So if that name sounds familiar, he used to play for Phoenix Suns. And then, yeah, that Kevin Johnson, he became our mayor in 2012. And he said, hey, Sacramento is the farm to fork capital of the whole nation. So that was a pretty big uh, task to carry, having a school district and just working around food in that area. You know, like, how are we gonna be the farm to fork capital of the whole nation? Uh, so a lot of eyes are on us. Uh, two, um, over the years, we either been one or two in the most diverse district mm -hmm. in the whole United States. So if you look on like niche.com, um, they'll have us at number one for the moment, meaning that we have all the different ethnicities uh, here in our school district, which is a great thing. And our staff are representative of it. And back then, we were under a management company. We were in, we were in the news because we were on the verge of a state takeover. Uh, the district wasn't doing so well. Nutrition services wasn't doing so well. Um, so we kind of came in and changed the narrative of how we do food and where we're at today. I'll fast forward a little bit to where we're at now. Um, May 26 ended our um, 759th day of consecutive service as the USDA waivers expired. So back when the pandemic hit, you know, USDA said you could serve on the curbside, um, serve these kids. It's a mandate. And we kind of did that through all the fires, through all the staff shortages, supply chain issues, pandemics. Um, and all the things that went along with it. Uh, hunger didn't take a break and therefore um, neither did we. So during spring break, holidays, weekends, Christmas, uh, we were there providing meals for students. And that was a huge benefit to our identity and a big uh, benefit to what we could provide for the students. Uh, we doubled farm to school during that time and you know, this is our story of how we did it. So as I look through chat, many of you are producers and let's, let's say, you know, in school food, especially in inst institutional cooking, there's a spectrum of um, food service directors or there's a spectrums of style of how we uh, plan a menu. There are food service directors in districts where um, you look at the components of the meal and you just make it fit. So unlike a restaurant, us in school food, 
we have to do things that are provide all the five requirements, fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy, grain, and make them fit within like a two servings for this plus a one serving of this um, vegetable subgroups. And we all kind of have to make it around uh, like a dollar 25, a dollar 50 cents just for food costs. So that's what we're working with. Um, but on the other side of it, we're like the biggest purchaser of, we're the largest purchaser of food for our whole entire city. So when we, when we start working out with five, with farmers, we would, when we say, Hey, I want to buy all your lettuce. Um, we would buy out like 75% of their land. So if we were to buy directly from them, um, bad thing like if we are on summer break or if we go on winter break and you're dedicating a lot of your land towards a school um there could be a downside to that but i mean just up front you probably hear me say this a couple times um the biggest barrier for school food and buying directly from farmers is we look at food through the lens of the food buying guide i'll say again it's like a usda food buying guide and you guys sell them in bushels, in boxes, in cases. Like we, we want to know, you know, part of the reason why we make food the way we do is because a lot of our suppliers say, hey, this is like half cup fruit serving. And who knows what a half cup is? It's like 128 case count of apples is equivalent to that. But if we can get a mediator, if we can kind of look and process through the food buying guide, um, we could, we'll start purchasing a lot more from farmers, um, just knowing that we speak uh, the same language when it comes to purchasing a food. So on the screen, I listed about five habits to look for when um, looking for a, for a school district or institutional school school to partner up with um so if you look around and you see if you, especially if you look around social media or if you hear of uh, districts that like to develop recipes like it's a cool thing for them um they would love to partner up with local farmers like if you go hey we're taste testing this new uh green bean casserole and we bought this green beans directly from um, Wild River Farm, just like in the picture. Um, we're going to see how the kids like it. They definitely, um, we're the ones that are looking for farmers to buy from. Um, if you ever hear, um, if you ever hear like the, the adage of like, hey, it's hard to find a school district to sell to, like look for the schools who are posting about recipe development. If there's like a, like a summer, if you look online and you see pictures of summer barbecues or developing new foods around certain holidays, um, those are districts more likely to buy directly from farmers. Two, a district that reviews the regulations um, will be more likely to purchase directly from farmers. And what I mean by regulations are like USDA regulations, um, yeah, state, local, and federal regulations that kind of change the uh, landscape of how we do things. In the peak of COVID, as of like May 26, before school ended, uh, we have, and we still do to this day, like 106 USDA waivers that allow us to serve kids to the fullest extent possible. So if you're kind of given that guideline of like here here's 106 ways that you can rules that you can kind of play around to serve kids um it kind of reveals that district's true like identity or their true vision uh there are like purchasing guidelines that they can lift um when there's the threshold can be higher uh, like look for those districts that are doing more innovative things and reviews regulation as number two. Number five, they're always looking for ways to improve. 
and that just with a lot of things. Um, you know, right now my team is off-site rewriting the menu. Um, we're finding out ways with um, all the regulations that we have that we can serve kids and ways that we can be more mobile. Um, just a little bit more open to innovation, so to speak. Uh, number four, uh, we connect a lot with colleagues. So we often, if you find one district uh, that could sell to them, you'll find others that think along this, the same line. And likewise for the farmers. I think the one of the things we say is like rock stars hang out with other rock stars. It's like when we find one farmer who would like to sell to school, oftentimes they're um, the same farmers that they hang out with other farmers that are trying new innovative things and selling to schools. And the other way around, like if one district, uh, if you find one district who's gonna purchase directly from you, they're also gonna be in the district that hang out with other districts that are looking for ways to, bringing, to bring in local and produced foods. So connects with other colleagues, that's number four. Number five, um, these districts build partnerships. Um, you know, there's a lot of existing things in school food already um, that help make farm to school a little bit more um, easy. So you don't have to like grind and do things just align with it. If you go online and you, if you go online on social media and you look up hashtags of like hashtag farm to school or like last week was um, farm to school week or farm to summer week, look up that hashtag farm to summer. And you see those districts that are posting it. Uh, those are districts that are more likely going to purchase directly from a, from a farmer. Um, before I proceed, any questions from these five? If not, I'll just wait till the end as planned and um, go on from there. Uh, just one quick question, Vince. Um, yeah. as, as a, um, the school district, are you requiring any kind of certification from the farmers? Um, you know, no certification. So the question is, do, are we requiring any certification? And no, not yet. Um, normally we do a visit. And if it, if it meets the guidelines of like good agricultural practices, as you discussed previously um, in the other seminar, um, you know, there's not any livestock on top of the hill that's flowing down and it's generally safe. Um, we, we will do business with you. And a lot of my colleagues will as well. Um, but I think, you know, part of that room for improvement is we're, we're building capacity to process our own food. Um, there's our district that just wants, want things pre-cut, pre-bagged, um, but Part of the fifth, part of the third habit is if we're building capacity to cut up cabbage, cut up greens, spin our own lettuce, um, you know, we want to make it easier for you um, to give us that price or make it to give us that quantity that we're looking for. So thank you. Good question. So fifth habit, build partnership. Um, you know, a school district builds great partnership. I'm gonna jump like I'm gonna jump ahead to that picture. Um, I'm in Sacramento. So March 15th, right that weekend we closed down for COVID. Um, Sacramento Kings, you know, had it they're a farm to fork um, arena. So the arena itself said, hey, we canceled all our games, we canceled all our um, we canceled all our um, concerts and events. Now we are sitting on all this produce. Um, would you like to take it? I said, of course we took like, we took eight pallets of produce that they had for their fans, for NBA players, et cetera. And, you know, we got both ends, the school district and uh, the Sacramento Kings got good publicity from there. But also with that, you know, a lot of local farmers noticed 
that and said, Hey, you guys are, you guys are local purchasers. Um, would you, would you want to do more business with us? And of course, with the waivers, we took them on and we built partnerships and even a food hub to go along with it. But the partnerships, uh, local farmers, growers, and producers, so not just exclusive to farms itself, like we partnered up with our local pizza company. Uh, we partner up with a local bakery um, to get more of these products. So it's not just exclusive to fruits and vegetables. Um, in this summer, uh, one of our goals is to purchase local, um, to start working on our red meats. So we're looking at like beef suppliers who, um, yeah, working our, with our beef suppliers to um, get that type of product um, in schools like board members and elected officials. Often they're the ones driving it. Being in Sacramento, our elected officials just, you know, asked, started asking us the questions like, hey, where is your food coming from? Um, and often with that, they have connections that we don't normally have. In Sacramento, we work with like our Senator, Senator Pans as our Senator, and he, you know, basically connected us with the Sacramento Meals, Sacramento Meals Collaborative, and we were able to go to state capital and throw like a big barbecue blog party to kick off summer feeding. Uh, we partnered a lot with vendors and distributors. And I'm gonna highlight one company, which is the fourth bullet point down. A community alliance with family farmers, you know, the second hardest thing about purchasing directly from an institution like a school food is there's once you reach that threshold for a micro purchase, which is anywhere from five to 10,000, depending on what state and, and local jurisdictions you may have, um, there's agencies out there, mostly California based. This is Community Alliance with Family Farmers. We call them CAF for short, that will draw up contracts for um, school districts and farmers. So they draw up. RFPs, like requests for proposals, that formalizes the um, that formalizes the process. You know, we are schools. We're we're school foods. We're publicly funded. Um, we're publicly funded, and therefore, you know, to protect the taxpayers' money, we they want to make sure that we're going through a process to get all the bids out there. Um, but once you get through that process, um, you can you can start um, selling directly to schools itself. So the two hardest parts, like I said, no use, no use like creating or trying to figure out your process itself, which is definitely one of my learning lessons from this. There's organizations out there that will have templates for you to. Uh, do these requests for proposals. You know, CAF just happens to be the one in our area. Um, I think with CAF, if you have one template that works for USDA in California, it can work in the Carolinas, can work throughout the states. Um, that's our, that's a, that is a hurdle that I hear other directors often say, I can't purchase directly from a farm. Um, I don't have an RFP and it, it is a lot to create it, but there's agencies out there that will do it. Otherwise, you know, in summer, we work a lot with our community centers and libraries to provide these foods. And, um, you know, as, as a food service director who provides food education, I believe, um, that I'm in the business of teaching kids about things they don't know they like yet. And I happen to do that with food. Um, you know, the, the good and bad of school food is, you know, the best quote unquote curriculum for me happened to be in the summertime, especially in, in California where we get all these stone fruits and tomatoes out there. Um, so if I'm gonna try and teach a kid about food, I wanna do it during summer especially at these community centers and libraries. And, um, you know, we, did, we get that summer break, but if I can go into that uh, community center 
and you know put tomatoes in front of kids like a cherry tomatoes is what we have in our fridge right now um they're more likely going to like tomatoes when they taste it during summer than the salad bar in november here in california um so i think just summer is a great opportunity just to open that um, partnership up with school districts you know sports teams like i said with the sacramento kings that was like the first time in my life where I did, where I got like publications out of something sports related. Um, noble figures like the, there's mascots, school mascots. The, um, you know, being in Sacramento, we had like Jeff Bridges from Big Lebowski um, kind of promote our meals. We have, yeah, we just have a lot of, we have a lot of cool notable figures that promote our school meals. So that's something to look for. So, you know, with that, a reoccurring message that I'll have is, you know, don't feel like you need to invent something. Um, just align with a lot of things that are already existing in place. You know, one of my favorite month in my line of work is October. Um, October is farm to school month. Farm to School Month is like all the, like all the things that we can, all the things Farm to School that we can do, uh, we do them in October. So, you know, oftentimes I'm busy with administrative stuff. So if I have a farmer that's willing to do a crunch day or a farmer's market, I'm more likely going to connect with them and partner up with them with that process. Um, so Farm to School Month is big. If you, so if you see a school district or if you, if you look at a school menu and they're celebrating Farm to School Month um, or trying to promote Farm to School Month, that's a ripe opportunity for, that's a ripe opportunity for you, like a local, um small scale um institution to be able to sell to these to these school districts and i say that because you know large distributors don't have the ability to i say it because the large distributors don't have the ability to to be as flexible as you especially with supply chains um especially with supply chain issues um you know we're like a big distributors in california i love them i'm just gonna say they're like cisco's and gold stars it's like our big box um distributors they can't like they can't give me the traceability of in most cases they can't give me the traceability of where this food comes from like if I say, hey, this lettuce is from Fiery Ginger Farms. Um, if I were to ask my supplier where this farm came from or who grew it, uh, they wouldn't be able to do that as fast as you guys would. And the great thing about like working with uh, school districts is you're feeding kids in the community that you're growing, that you are growing in. So Farm to School Months is one. Harvest of the Month is another like national program where every single month, just like it sounds, they're promoting um, a specific food type to get the kids to try that. There's take home activities, there's activity kits, um, and most likely they're promoting it on the menu and seasonal to uh, what we're serving. Two, farmers markets is a big one. So, you know, with the with the changes in school, you know, gone are the days where we celebrate accomplishments with like pizza and cookies and ice cream. They, I know they still exist, but um, I'm using the word should. They shouldn't <laughs> exist. Um, what we do nowadays is like, hey, if a class did well, we're gonna bring out a farmer and we're gonna have a farmer's market. 
you get a token and you get to get a piece of fruit, a piece of apricot, um, a bag of lettuce that you could take uh, because um, you did so well. And often what's cool with that is, you know, I'll hear story the next day or the next week of how the family made like something like pico de gallo, onions, tomatoes, uh, cilantro. Um, and they made a recipe and like all the cool things that the family made with that meal. We did like spaghetti squash during the fall. And I heard all the cool spaghetti squash recipes from not only the kids, but from the parents as well. Um, and it makes me like the coolest person in the district for that week. Uh, like I'm the guy that sent out sp um, spaghetti squash or sent out, um, yeah, spinach. So farmer's market are becoming more and more of a way to celebrate events at schools rather than, um, yeah, rather than cupcakes and ice cream. Technically, we're not supposed to do like those, we're not supposed to do those type of, type of competitive foods is what we'll call them. Um, they're supposed to fall within our guidelines um, so if you can send one of your staff members or if you out there uh, can go out and run the farmer's market, then that's like a win-win. And I know in my district, like when a farmer goes out, um, they'll ask for the farmers, they'll ask for like the farmer's names for themselves. Like, hey, where's, where's farmer Bill? Um, or I'll get asked like, hey, did farmer Bill or farmer Shane grow this lettuce? Um, so there's that connection to that community. Um, two, especially with, um, especially for districts that have grants, like cooking and gardening classes are a big thing. Um, yeah, cooking and gardening classes are a way to engage with the school district. Like we do cooking with kids. And that's separate with like gardening with kids, you know, kids in the picture right there. I think kids cooking make like really cool pictures um, and they get to taste things that they make. As food service director, I'm, I'm different because I have that culinary background as a food service director. I know very little about gardening. So respect to you guys. Um, with cooking for most food service directors, they know very little about cooking on like being able to teach cooking. Um, so if you or your staff could do it and there's grants out there to do these type of things, um, definitely a win-win for the district and for the uh, community as well. So Farm to School Month, we mentioned. Crunch Day is another one. So Crunch Day is like, a month, a day in October. Every state has kind of had their own separate date, but we will make a day in October where, um, where we will all crunch, normally circled around an apple around the same time and just join other districts throughout the nation as we crunch on, it used to be like an apple crunch day, but a local, uh, local group, or sorry, local crop to celebrate like the local growth. Um, summer meals, so we do summer meal celebration with barbecues, celebrations, et cetera, and other local events. Sacramento, we have like farm to summer week or farm to fork week where we just line up outside the Capitol. So any of those events, you know, cooking festivals, state fairs, county fairs, um, those are great ways to highlight your program and to highlight the school district as well. Now, these are just examples, you know, point being um, just aligned with a lot of existing things. Um, yeah, align with existing things, look on the local calendar and see what else comes um, with it. Any questions um, before I move on from there? And then Lisa, how am I doing on time? You're you're doing okay. I think we got about five minutes, and then yeah. we will open up for a Q and A. But we did have a question come through the chat from yes. Christine: Would the grants be for the school district or for the farmer to apply to teaching or or cooking? Um, yeah. Cool. So um, there's 
So the answer to uh, where the grant would apply would be both. So we, as a school district, have been awarded grants. And then uh, with COVID, um, our farmer, so our farmer, Fire Ginger Farms, um, did a grant to do a food hub. So there, we had one farmer, it was like a matchmaker type of thing, where one school district, that's us, and one farm, Fire Ginger Farms, um, said, hey, I know, I know a bunch of school districts that would love to replicate what we're doing. And the farmer said, well, I know a bunch of local farms that would love to sell their food, but we just don't know how. Uh, so we kind of, they did a grant to do the food hub. And now we have about two dozen, they have about two dozen farms that they um, could source. And they could source and meet our demands. Because I get it. In most cases, if you have like two, three acres, you know, we're serving, we're serving like 10,000 meals a day and we're requiring kids to take a half cup piece of fruit. That's a lot of fruit. If we're required to do all these veggies out there, that's a lot of veggies. Um, you know, I think joining up um, is going to be, is going to be a thing. I think the future, I'll kind of end on this, um, the future of uh, farm to school is good. The, farm, the future of farm to school is great because one, it's becoming harder and harder for large institutions to supply school food. I get it. The markup for retail versus the markup in uh, restaurants and hotels is much higher and it's not worth it for most institutions to scale sell to food or to sell to schools but where we have in school food is we have like a minimum like 180 days of service of thousands and thousands of meals i mean you just got to know that if you, you got to plan for that um if you get like one school district that's consistently buying from you a minimum of 180 days that's assuming they don't do any summer feeding winter or spring break feeding um that's a lot of volume that um that's a lot of volume that we have um you know we can there's that you know business perspective at what price point does it make sense for you guys and i think for most cases our budget for like a piece of fruit is like 25 cents per serving 25 to 30 cents per serving for like a half cup serving of fruit and you kind of just do the math and see where it works out. Um, the grants, you know, the grant on a big federal level is USDA. Uh, there's a USDA farm to school grant uh, that's out there. It's a lot of paperwork. Uh, it being a federal program, that's one. Um, but definitely allows us to do things like cooking with kids, gardening with kids. Um, and all the unique celebrations we got we bought a fruit truck with them um so usda farm to school grant that's one uh, we also have a no kid hungry grant i know they're a national organization so no kid hungry has given us more money to buy directly from farmers to throw up some school gardens some a food truck delivery vehicles so things you know as long as it's in the umbrella of giving kids more food access uh, that's out there. You know, in California, there's grants here and there. Um, often look at your grocery store to see if there's a grant that allows you to supply foods to schools. So, you know, in ending, yeah, in ending, little typo there on my half, 759 days of consecutive service. That's April 27, 2020 to like May 26, 2022. Um, during the pandemic, we doubled our farm to school. Like we, as a school district, knowing our price point, if you can't sell quote unquote imperfect foods to like the grocery stores and the restaurants, we'll take them. Like we... 
we had a farmer who couldn't sell cherries because they had that word split in the middle. I don't know what it's called. So it's slightly imperfect, um, but they sold it to us at a price that uh, makes sense. And we were able to provide all our students like one pound of cherry each, which is a lot of cherries. And then even with that, because we do farm to school, our increase, our participation increased 127%. So, you know, it's a, you know, a lot of people get into farming and trying to sell to farmers markets, restaurants, hotels, but you no know, schools are in here and um, we provide a very unique niche of our buy box and what we like to do. So yeah, if I'll take any questions from here. And feel free to add questions to the chat or if you just wanna come off mute, um, if you have any questions. I put a link to um, the 2021 Farm to School grantees um, where you can go and you can look and see in each state who's who's been granted. So it seems like that might be another good resource to kind of see uh, potential school district matches. Cause I think one of the things that I got from your presentation is it might not be as easy as working with your local county school district. There's a little more research and, and matchmaking to find uh, maybe a school district that is set up and enthusiastic about farm to school. Yeah, and there's definitely like, look for the signs, like districts that are in, that like to create recipes and like to promote like farm to school. We're gonna be the ones that are more open to it. Uh, Nina, am I saying your name right? Yes, yes, Queen Nina. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Um, this, I'd, I'd like to talk to you, Vince, to see if we could even engage further, because this really sounds ideal uh, for my organization, and I'm super passionate about uh, food equity and underserved communities. In uh, 2015, I started a wellness and nutrition food security program called Let's Be Whole. It's a, a nonprofit. And so uh, we do, we offer holistic wellness education to underserved communities, but additionally, weekly, we also offer um, food, food recovery and distribution. So these are foods that I get, groceries I get from Whole Foods, from Trader Joe's, from different farm organizations that I'm connected with as a, a mobile food pantry. And so uh, Let's Be Whole is starting to really get uh, establish a presence out there. And so now, especially lately, um, I've gotten an influx of, of calls from schools requesting if Let's Be Whole can come and bring food to the schools, the, the health uh, navigators who work there for LA Unified are, are calling me. So I started taking food, uh, donating food to a couple of the schools. And then um, somebody else, a principal wanted me to come bring food. And um, she has suggested if I could get some kind of vendor agreement, mm -hmm. because when I was bringing the food, it was unofficial, even though it was serving the students and the, the surrounding community. But now I'm going to sign up. They sent me the paperwork to sign up as a vendor. But um, so additionally, uh, <clears throat> besides Let's Be Whole, I'm also the chairwoman of the California Women in Agriculture Association. And this is a chapter of a national women's farm organization called the National Women in Agriculture. We're about 2,500 female farmers across the US agribusiness women and so forth. My folks, I, like you, Vince, I'm not a grower. I'm a, a, a business agribusiness woman and promoter and marketer of, um, of food producers because I'm a food activist. So, uh, so I, I am planning right now, I've been developing a curriculum to teach uh, agriculture in the schools. I work with uh, black farmers here in Los Angeles and minority farmers. Um, I'm just totally about empowering our underserved communities to teach them about food equity, what food security looks like and how to grow your own food. So I would love to, you know, be able to build upon this program and, and work with the schools by aggregating the food producers that I do um, work with. Yeah, Nina, thank you. I think we have a lot of overlapping vision. I put my email in the chat. Yep. Okay, great. Hey, Feel free to reach out to me, and that, that's also true for anyone. Um, 
Perfect. Yeah. I yeah, I do answer. I do answer all the emails and then I see Jenny. Jenny's question is, are there different tax regulations when selling to schools? Uh, Jenny, I don't know that one hundred percent. I know we're uh you know that we do the 501 nonprofit um paperwork. Um I will have to check on that one. I don't anyone else knows that specific answer? Feel free to jump on, but I don't I don't know that one. If, if you do find out, we could include it in a follow-up um, email to registrants um, and, and put it on our blog afterwards as well. I'd say if there's no other immediate questions for Vince, I'll turn it over to Ray to kick us off with our farmer panel. Thank you and welcome to the ones who joined us after we gave our initial welcome. Uh, tonight, we have two farmers with us. We have York Glover and Kamal Bell. Uh, York Glover is a retired Clemson University Agricultural Extension Agent and the Secretary of the Gullah Farms Cooperative. He is a founding member of the cooperative. Uh, Mr. Glover spent his career working with small farmers in Beaufort County, and he has managed a tomato packing cooperative. Mr. Glover is also a county council member representing St. Helena Island uh, in South Carolina. Uh, we also have with us Kamal Bell. He's a farmer and chief operating officer of St. Kofa Farms, LLC. He is also a Durham County public school teacher that helps integrate his agricultural passion and principles into the classroom. Sankofa Farms LLC is a multifaceted agricultural entity that seeks to assist changing the food intake habits of those living in and affected by food deserts. And so I think what we would like to do tonight is to uh, just kind of have our um, farmers kind of give us a little bit about what they're doing or a little bit more intro that maybe wasn't included in what I had. And then I have some questions that uh, that we will go through with you all, and then we'll take some questions from our participants. So we can start with you, Mr. Glover. You're still on mute there, Mr. Glover. Should be the little microphone icon in the very bottom left of the screen. And Lisa, I think as the host, you make an unmute him. I'm not sure. Oh, I could. I asked to unmute. Maybe we'll go to Kamal first. All right, let's go. Uh, Kamal, we'll go with you first. Okay, um, can you hear me okay, now? Everyone, can everyone, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go, go back ahead, to the original go, plan. Go, go ahead, no, go ahead, Kamal. Go ahead, Kamal. I know, you can go ahead, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be a part of this uh, discussion. Um, I don't know where to start uh, other than to jump into the Farm to School project uh, that we started with the Farmers Co-op uh, some 10, 12 years ago. And one of the things that um, Vince talked about was partnership. And so when we started the Farmers School project, uh, we got in contact as I was an extension agent at the time, got in contact with all the local uh, leaders from county council, school board, uh, the health center, uh, the farmers, um, uh, different other alliance group um, to talk about the farm to school and to get them to buy into it. As a result of that, we were able to start a farm to school program with the farmers and the school. Beaufort County had a, a, a vendor, a food vendor preparing food for the system. And they could not actually buy from us because we really wouldn't qualify to, um, as a vendor for them. So we had to work out a relationship with the school district who was very much interested in us providing fresh food, fresh vegetables to the students. And so we actually were selling our product um, to the schools, um, but delivering it to the, all the schools itself. Um, um, so that worked out well for us at the time. Since that time, 
that same food vendor has worked out a relationship with a local purveyor that's now delivering the product, for, will be delivering the product for us to all the schools. Um, we had to take a hiatus uh, for about four years um, because we needed a facility and now we are now in that facility. So we're going back to that relationship with the school district, providing them the farm uh, fish, fresh vegetables, uh, which will be a part of their menu. One of the things that I would say about the farm to school project is that students were known to eat the fresh vegetables coming to the schools. Um, so when we delivered the collards, the broccoli, the cabbage uh, to them, um, it was actually a day or two old. I remember one day we delivered a pro some broccoli to a school and the broccoli was harvested that day um, before, processed that day and delivered to the school the next day. And they actually served it to the school, to the students. And the teachers say that they have never seen first graders eat broccoli like that before. It was like, it was like I guess, candy for them, but they ate it all up. Um, and so it became very clear that if the product was actually fresh, students actually ate it. Um, but if they got the commodity product from the federal government, um, they did not eat it as much. Um, so that's where we are with the Farm to School project. Um, we're still in the infant stage. Uh, we're still trying to advance and build capacity. Um, one of the things that we are doing with, the, with our product is that we're preparing it for the, for, the, for the school. So we are doing chopping, the collards, we're doing lettuce, uh, we're doing the broccoli, uh, we're doing the cabbage. We're actually preparing it for them and they are actually pick, taking it right in, and put it right into the pot. Um, we are serving them, we're delivering them in bags of three pound bags, uh, which is uh, the size that is ideal for uh, a, a institution. Um, uh, and so that's, for us, that's what has been really working uh, well for us. Now, with the surplus product, we're trying to get into the wholesale channel and that's gonna be more challenging for our farmers uh, because one of the things that we have to deal with now is how do we, how do we get a quality product to a wholesale chain. And farm heat is a major factor for that. Um, so we have to work through all of that, but we are determined to be a part of the food industry on a regional level. Um, we are not trying to sell to California. We won't let California take care of itself. Uh, we wanna sell uh, in the region around South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Kamal, you want to give us a little bit about kind of what you're doing, and then we can get into our questions. Uh, yes. Um, right now, we uh, we have a lot going on at the farm. Um, I actually just came there. I came from here, so I'm actually in my farm and attire. Right now, we have seven hot capital tunnels. Um, they're 14 feet wide, 100 feet long. Uh, we have a, a 30 by 72 foot equip um, USDA high tunnel. We got the big equip program. Um, we also have 46 beehives right now. Um, we're actually trying to get that number down. We have a youth academy. Um, one of our students is going to be out starting this week for the summer. And um, we're doing a lot of wholesaling in the area um, to uh, Weaver Street. Um, we work with some other distributions in the area. Um, we sell the CSAs. We actually just started our CSA, which we're building out at the moment. Um, and we're also, we do a lot of bee education. We, we have an Airbnb at the farm where people can come out and learn about bees. Um, we do a lot of content on education for people who are just getting into farming or getting into gardening where they can, uh, we give them little tips on how to grow specific um, foods in their backyard. Uh, um, 
trying to think what else do we do um i'm also working on the project right now which is going to be developing the school i used to teach at lowe's grove i'm going to be redeveloping their courtyard and um looking to do a farmer's market with the youth there at lowe's grove middle school so on top of all of that um we're, we're trying to we're trying to get that i've already started that project so i should be done and have their garden ready by um the beginning of, of this upcoming school year and I will do a lot of youth education and um, entrepreneurship training with the students there in uh, here in Durham. Very good. Thank you, Kamal. Our first question, uh, you no guys problem. kind of already touched on a little bit about how did you get uh, started selling uh, to a school? Anything you want to add uh, to kind of how you fostered that relationship or how you kind of got your foot in the door? Sure. Let me let me just say this: that uh, one of the things, one of the key person um, on the financial side for us in getting started was actually the involvement of the chairman of county council, our local county government, um, because we needed um, startup funds, and he was able to um, support us getting local county funds. To help get us to get us uh, uh, get us started, we were able to get a grant uh, for equipment um, through USDA, and because we were not a nonprofit organization at the time, we had to work with another uh, agency, uh, local agency, to allow them uh, to that that allow us to apply for the grant uh, under their umbrella. So the equipment that we actually have, about $100,000 worth of equipment, was actually, is actually owned by that institution, but they have no use for it. So we have it at our co-op at this time. Um, but you know, it, having local government um, supporting you financially, uh, believing you, and um, uh, it, it carries you a long ways. And that's what we had um, to build that relationship not only the school district who wanted the product, but we also had the local government to, to invest in the co-op. And they are still doing that at this time. Uh, in Buford, the building that we are in, which is about a 10,000 square foot building, was an old building that was sitting there and we were able to get that building from the county government. So we actually own it <clears throat> along, <clears throat> excuse me, along with five acres of land about an acre of that or half an acre of that is actually a pond, a retention pond, but uh, we own actually five acres uh, of property right there. And next door to that five acres of property is another five acres of property owned by the county government that we will be looking at leasing in the future with uh, hoop housing. So uh, we have one hoop house on our facility now. Um, and as we look at expanding those hoop houses, uh, we're looking at using and leasing that property from the county government. So having that relationship and having that um, local government supporting you, I think is also crucial in working with small farmers. Thank you. <clears throat> Kamal, anything to add? It's like for us, it's a, um, it's a work in progress with our new program that we're doing now. So um, we've like, engaged the county with um, selling directly, but we got some pushback. So now we're looking at more innovative ways to, to get food out into the community um, where we can kind of bypass some of the restrictions that Durham County has had in the past. They want you to be GAP certified. So we, um, we're we looking at now at more of the entrepreneur route. So the students will get food by default participating, but um, selling directly to Durham public schools is a whole nother, um, a whole nother, uh, I, I want to say animals. It's another, it's something that we'll have to come back and um, we'll need some help on. A whole lot of help on. Gotcha. Um, how do you guys, I know you talked a little bit about, um, Kamal, you having the Calipito tunnels and a hot tunnel and uh, I think Ms. Glover said you all had a hoop house. How do you ensure uh, you have sufficient quantities quantities and, and how to and kind of just talk a little bit about having the, that infrastructure. How does that help you? I mean, obviously we know it helps you extend your growing season, but how beneficial is it to you to uh, to kind of go into these markets? Um, we haven't stopped selling food 
Oof, since the pandemic started, we haven't had a break. So the tunnels have allowed us to grow through the year. And we actually are getting some climate and control high tunnels that um, the pieces are slowly coming in now um, that we're going to be using this year. We'll be growing in, hopefully, heading into the winter. But we were able to grow celery through the winter this year, which is a um, – you can kind of corner the market with products like that. So for us, it's just a, it's just a way for us to always have food. Um, I don't, we haven't skipped a beat and we just keep on getting food into the ground with the system. And once you start working in that system and getting food in consistently, um, the market is here and we can't keep enough food at this point. Like we're, we're like, we're out of food. Like right now we have things coming in, but we, we, the demand is so high in this area at the moment. Good. Anything to add, Mr. Glover? You're back on mute. Um, I got a little detained there. Let me show I understand the question. Um, um, I can tell you that we have um, a hoop house that we are basically looking at um, supplying the uh, co-op and production for the farm and school during the winter months. Uh, we don't need a hoop house uh, during the summer months. Uh, we have um, ample weather uh, probably too hot right now but you know we can produce during the summertime but in the month of january and february there's no guarantee that we can actually produce a product in the field so we're using the hoop houses um, at that time to supply the broccoli and the lettuce and all the product and stuff to, uh, to the school district and stuff great thank you do either of your farms have to hold any uh, specific food certifications uh, to sell to any of these institutions? Uh, yes, the school district don't require a, a, a farmer to have certification, uh, but it does require the facility uh, to be certified. So we are GAP certified or we are certified um, at the facility, but we, are made a, we made it a requirement that our, GAP, our farmers to be GAP certified, just to be on the safe side. Um, um, and of course, with that comes the, um, the, the traceability, which is a key factor um, in, in food safety. What about you, Kamal? We have to have insurance policies for um, some of the markets that we're selling into now. But for us, I, I try to look for markets where we don't have to have extensive certifications. Um, and that's more so just from like a loophole standpoint, but we do have uh, insurances for some of the vendors that we sell to. Hey, our next question involves around packaging. And Mr. Glover, I know you mentioned that you all are doing three pound uh, bags uh, when you're doing your lettuce and collards and things. Have you found, um, I know you said that being ideal for like maybe like leafy greens, but any other things that you all are selling to institutions, uh, packaging, has that been an issue? Or is it, do you kind of, decide how you're going to package or do you work with the school or the institution on the packaging and what they may require or would like? That's that's what it came down to actually what the school will handle and what they would want. Um, but at the same time, we, we are looking to sell to other um, vendors and and that requirement may mean um, a, um, a pound of lettuce. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really depends on where we're selling it, but for the school it became one of um, a larger volume of product. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kamal, I know you're you're selling to uh, you know institutions, a lot of different places, farmers markets, and all. How how are you handling packaging? You know, given that you're in so many different markets. So we we use totes, and um, we have a freezer at the farm. So after we harvest in the field, we'll put our products in the freezer um, for about twenty minutes. Let them get the field heat off of them if we're doing it in the evening. And then we'll move them to, um, I think those are like 25 gallon totes, like the ones you get at Walmart, the small bins. Um, and we pack up there, you could probably get around um, anywhere from 15 to 18 bundles of um, leafy greens in, or around lettuce, the same thing. And then we, we stack them up and drop them off at the locations. And we just turn the AC on in the car if we're doing it in the, um, in the in the middle of the day or the late evening but um 
that's it's been pretty simple that we're just using storage containers and making sure we clean them and sanitize them and we transport our food that way unless somebody like requires something like like certain places want turnips with tops or so once you start getting requests like that you kind of adjust accordingly gotcha thank you we had one question in the chat around contracting and it kind of go along with my next question um do you contract with schools? Do you do you contract prior to the growing season? Are the contracts seasonal or year round? Uh, we can start with you this time, uh, Kamal. Um, so for us, with um, say like a gro the grocery store, we started in like a small capacity, and then we scaled up, and they and they um, order the majority of the leafy greens from us. Um, Everywhere else, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, we've actually went with we're growing with one distribution where at, they take everything we have. So they can take up to 700 items a week. So um, I, we're not at that point yet. We won't be there for probably like another year or two. But um, we're slowly building relationships out with, with organizations and then allowing them to increase their order and capacity based on where we are at the moment. So like right now, we're um, kind of taking a break to build the rest of the infrastructure of the farm. And then, and then, then we're taking like a two week break. And then after these next two weeks, we're gonna kick back up and have every, every system at the farm running in order to increase our, our growing capacity. Thank you. Mr. Glover? Uh, yes, we, we had a, uh, a standard um, contract with the school district to sell, um, the various commodity, uh, the product is to the school district. So there was a price for say cabbage, the uh, broccoli. Um, we got into lettuce. Uh, we never sold, we haven't sold a, a head of lettuce yet to the school district, but we, we, uh, we are growing lettuce because the school district actually um, uh, had a salad bar every day. And we wanted to impact that school district every day. And so um, we, we, we started growing romaine lettuce just for the school district, but we haven't sold a, a head of lettuce to the school district yet. Uh, however, what we're finding out is that we can grow it, we can produce it, and we'll establish a, a contract with uh, this new food vendor that we, we're dealing with um, at this time uh, to sell that product. But we felt that um, uh, we wanted to have a standard price with the school district, so we did not go up and down on the market every every uh, every day. Um, with our other vendors, uh, we are selling based on the market.